Good morning. This is Kathy Beatty with Divorce Support Anonymous. Kind of caught you off guard coming to you at a different hour, but that's okay. Wanted to give you some information that will be recorded. You can review it later if you're not able to watch us live right now. But I'm very excited because I have someone who's going to help us understand our teenagers and our young folks as we go through the trauma of divorce. Uh, I caught Jim Murray and his travels going from place to place, but he is here with us. And Jim Murray has graduated from the Moody Bible Institute with a degree in youth ministry. He has his master's in divinity and a master's in counseling from Grand Rapids Theological Seminary. He's worked with teens in a number of areas from coaching, uh, baseball and volleyball at Forest Hills Central and being a youth leader. He's worked as a counseling intern at Lowell Middle School and Beacon of Hope Christian Counseling in Holland. So let me bring him in here. Hello, Jim. Good morning. It's great to have you with us uh, in helping us to tackle and to understand how we can help our, our teenagers and our older adult children as we go through the trauma of divorce. So I want to start today, Jim, just to help us remember the pressures that teens and young people are dealing with right now before the pandemic, before dealing with divorce, there is so much pressure on these kids socially with social media and different uh, different areas that my children never experienced, I certainly never experienced. So help us, remind us of the social pressures and the pressures in general that teenagers and youth have right now. Yeah, I feel like every couple of years it keeps getting like even worse as well uh i remember just a couple of years ago i was sitting in on a conference uh at kelvin college and it was on it was an mit professor who was talking her book is uh generation iy and it was just the beginning of this like social media type stuff and i feel like Ever since then, things are getting like even worse. Yeah, you have the social pressures of, I mean, we've all seen it, of kids on their phone nonstop. And it's all about the likes and trying to get, not even necessarily friends, just trying to get people to like whatever it is that they're doing, whether it's clothes, whether it's appearances, or just like your average... I mean, you're seeing it like cups of coffee, like kids are trying to take selfies with their coffee and whatever that is, they're trying to get the the likes and the attentions of of people yeah, around the world. I'm, I'm running into like teens that I'm seeing them on their phone and I'm like, hey, who are you snapping with? And it's teens here in West Michigan and they're like, Oh, it's somebody in Florida. It's somebody in West Virginia. And I'm like, do you even know that person? No, never met them, but they're following me. So I'm snapping them back. And so there's those pressures of social media. And then it's, it goes right into school as well of now you're trying to keep up the appearances in school and around your like actual friends and your people that you actually see face to face you're trying to impress them keep up with them uh, so yeah there's a lot of social pressures and then also i mean you have the everyday pressures of trying to keep up on school and whatever extracurriculars you're doing as well you're trying to keep up on that and just kids are busy nowadays so it's it's a lot of a lot of pressure all around, I think. It, it just seems like they have to be constantly on. Um, you know, there's no downtime. There's no, yeah, I, I feel for those kids because that's so, uh, it's so artificial in so many ways. And yet they're longing, I would imagine, as all of us are, for true, authentic connection. And yet yep. we're looking in the wrong areas. So, yeah, that, that sums it up well. So, okay, let's talk about teens and young adults as they experience their parents' divorce. Now, uh, they may withdraw, they may take sides, lash out, 
or even deny what's happening. Can you tell us some of the experience you have had with the youth and young adults as they experience their parents' divorce or other traumas in their lives? One of the the ways I've always put it is more or less, I call it playing the game. And what I've seen a lot of times, and it's it's different with with every person. Everybody handles things differently. And that's that's life in general as well, not just divorce. But one of the common things I see is what I mean by playing the game is kind of playing sides, but using it to their advantage of mom says, I can't do this, but dad will let me. So I'll go to dad. And I've seen it a lot of times, especially when it comes to getting stuff of, well, mom won't let me get this new phone, but I know dad will. So I'll go to dad or I got grounded from my phone from mom. So I'll go to dad and he'll give me a new phone and he won't ever ground me. Uh, So that's what I mean by playing the game. And I see it a lot, especially like more of the high school age, middle school, high school teens that try to manipulate mom or dad into more or less getting what they want. And I think eventually they figure out that what they're doing is kind of manipulation and eventually regret it. But in the time it's, Hey, I get what I want. It makes me feel better. And they kind of, they never realize that it's hurting mom or dad of what they're doing, what they're, what they're taking advantage of. Um, But that's, that's one of the common things I've seen with a lot of teens that I work with. The younger kids that I've worked with, I think they're too young to really try to take advantage of a parent. But definitely you get that high school age teen that I think they kind of know what they're doing, but using it to their advantage as well. So that may be what they're doing initially or at first. They're, they're seeing that vulnerable point of mom and dad and they're taking advantage of it. But what's going on in, inside of their, their mind and heart at this point, other than seeing a place to take advantage? What's really going on with them? I think a lot of it is, is they're wanting the attention as well. Mm-hmm. Um, there's kind of that neglect. Um, I mean, a lot of times you'll hear students say they're stuck in the middle. They're kind of in between, like more or less, they're the battleground. Um, for the most part, it's mom and dad are trying to decide over custody and that kind of stuff. And the student feels like they're stuck in the middle. And I think part of that is they, they kind of play this game to get the attention. And if I go to mom, if I go to dad over this, now they're giving me something. They're giving me the attention. And because a lot of the times when they're in the middle, they're the ones being neglected. And it's all these battles over stuff. And so the child now is feeling like, okay, this is my way to be seen and heard and talk to mom or dad. And yeah, it might be, I guess, kind of screwed up how they're doing it, but it's, they're getting that attention finally that they've, they're seeking for. Mm-hmm. And that makes sense. Um, sometimes uh, these teenagers or young adults will lash out and say hurtful things um, to the parents. So can you help us not to take that so personally or to help us better understand what's going on with them as they lash out at us? I think it's kind of hard not to take it personally just because we're we're human Mm -hmm. and yeah, words hurt. And everybody's kind of been told that of ever since we're young, that what we say hurts people. And so I think it's kind of hard to not take it personally, but it's realizing that these kids are hurting as well. And a lot of the time that's, that's their way of getting that frustration out. Um, And one thing I I've always kind of dealt with 
with students, not even just going through divorce, but even when it comes to like sports and stuff is giving that time afterwards of sure. They might explode at us, uh, say hurtful things. And it's too easy for us to be emotional and come at it at a high level and just fire right back and you get into those arguments then and nothing is ever helpful when two people are heated and things are escalating. So I think it's, it's really important to try to de-escalate those situations and take time, not even necessarily right then, but giving your child some space, letting them calm down a little bit and then going back because we've always heard the term cooler heads prevail. And when you're able to calm both of you down really, and eventually go back and talk through what was said, I think it helps both sides because then you're able to, once your teen is kind of calmed down a little bit, you're able to go like, okay, you said this, what do you mean? Mm -hmm. And you're able to kind of unpack what was said there. Uh, so I think so much of it relies on time. And that's why, like with coaching, we always said the 24 hour rule of sure, a parent's going to be mad over my coaching decision and they're going to want to lash out at me right after the game and come at me and be like, well, why didn't my kid play? And we always say 24 hours. If you're still upset tomorrow, talk to me, email me. And that's, I think with parents and kids, not necessarily a 24 hour rule, but giving some time to calm down on both sides and talk through, okay, what did you mean here? And okay, you said this, it hurt. Why'd you say it? Okay. Um, and so, yeah, you're able to, when everybody's calm, you deescalate the situation and then it's a learning moment. And now you're able to, okay, Let's talk through this. I like that. It takes a lot of patience on the parents' part um, and certainly on the youth as well, uh, that we do separate for a moment and come back together. And then the more unemotional we can be when we come back together, I think is really helpful. And Jim, when I work with parents who have uh, maybe one parent is going off the deep end, the other parent is trying to maintain or survive, I always say, if you can be that consistent parent, hmm. just that continually consistent parent that doesn't waver, that doesn't uh, do drastic things, your child is going to be, number one, better off. But secondly, they're going to figure things out. Um, so if you are ready to despair because you're not able to connect with your youth or your young adults, maybe you just need to step back give it a little time, but also remember, if you can be that consistent parent for them, it's going to help them tremendously. Hmm. So um, let me ask you this, Jim. Some youth like to get in the business of the divorce, uh, such as the finances. Why are you spending this money? What is dad giving you? What is mom doing? Um, with with finances and different areas. So how do parents maintain their boundaries and protect their children from dealing in these really heavy issues that they really are not emotionally equipped to handle? And I think it even goes harder, like deeper as well with some, some kids of not even just getting in the business of it, but also sitting on the outside of the fear and worry of, are we going to lose our house? And yet kids and teens really struggle with that. And a lot of it isn't always external as well of like telling mom and dad that a lot of it, especially on the counseling side, you see them struggling internally of these fears of what's going to happen. Are we going to have to move? And <laughs> So I think a lot of it comes as parents, the, the reassurance that sure, this is a hard time, but everything's going to be okay. You don't have to worry about money. And especially at a young age, it's, it's something hard to 
try to teach them like, Hey, don't, don't worry about it. Mom and dad, we've got this. Like, Mm -hmm. sure. We're not perfect. We're not on the same, like, obviously if things were perfect, they'd still be together, but it's that reassurance of like, you don't need to worry about this. We, we've got things under control. That's what the lawyers and all of this, that's what their job is for. So it's trying to, I mean, for the most part, keep their minds busy and make sure that they're not worried about that because yeah, it, it definitely drains on them emotionally, physically and everything to the point where you, you usually see it. Uh, and sometimes it's not the, the verbal interaction, but you see it definitely taking a toll on them. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's that reassurance of telling them, Hey, don't, don't you worry about this. It's between mom and dad. Yeah. I, I love that. And I don't think that, um, well, I guess you could say it too many times, but it, it bears repeating that you say this consistently uh, that mom, we're going to take care of this. We're going to handle it. You take care of your grades and worry about basketball. Uh, we'll take care of this adult stuff. Um, I think that's really important that, that we repeat that. Um, there are those um, teenagers and young adults who want to dictate what their parents should be doing. And um, can you help us with some leverage that we can use um, to, again, put up those healthy boundaries of saying, this is adult stuff, you don't have to worry about it. And what happens is if you have one parent who's continually feeding the youth and young adults this information, and you have another parent who really wants that to be healthy, how can we as parents, um, first of all, stop what we're doing if we're, do- if we're feeding that negativity and that mature information to our children, stop. And also, what can we do if you have the other spouse that's, that's doing that, the other parent that's doing that for the children? Um, what leverage can they use? Yeah, I think that's a little bit more of where like playing the game comes in as well of, your child's going to want to go to the parent that sides with them and kind of gives them what they want. And a lot of it is hard as well because you're trying to control and tell the other parent what to do. And yeah, a lot of times that's, that's not going to work. So, I mean, doing your best to try to, to, not involve the student with this. I mean, it's, it's definitely hard because yet, like you said, usually there's that one parent that kind of wants to use the child as leverage. And it's so hard to get away from that. Um, Especially if you're the level headed parent, it's, you know, what they're doing is wrong and trying to convince them, Hey, cut it out leave them out of this and it's one thing for us to say it and try to do it it's something else to actually get the buy-in from the other person and that's that's the hard part where we can say all this stuff but is it necessarily going to happen and we're going to be the bigger person and say all of this and, but if there's not the buy-in from the other that's where it's, it's hard. So I definitely say, keep trying, keep trying, keep it reinforcing that, Hey, we need to leave them out of this. Like this is between us and like leave them out of it. And it's just that just keep saying it, keep saying it. Hopefully they buy in as well. And hopefully it's, we can both be adults here and work through this, leave the kids out of it. That's the hope. Obviously, there's there's times we've all seen it and heard about it where things get real messy and ugly. And Mm -hmm. obviously, we hope that isn't the case, but we're all broken people and that sometimes happens. Yeah. And you being a a youth pastor and a counselor at some of the schools and are at Lowell School, and you've probably seen a lot of stories that these young people bring to you. So 
as parents, and again, if, if you're listening and you are the one who's trying to maintain and be level, don't underestimate your consistency as a parent, your continual re um, of confirming that you're going to be okay and we're going to be okay. It's going to be different. It's going to be difficult, but we're going to make it through this. So be that encouraging, that uplifting voice to your youth and to your young adults and keep those boundaries up that there are things that these kids should not be having to decide or figure out or even think about. Um, so give us from a youth perspective, Jim, um, some good things, some good and positive things that we can do as parents to help our young people and our older, um, our 20s, our kids in our 20s, our teenagers, that older segment. Um, how can we be healthy and help them get through this trauma? I think the biggest thing is to keep things as normal as possible. Obviously, things are going to change of who they're living with, if it's mom or dad or both, uh, like things are going to be different, but try to keep things normal. If your child's involved in athletics or extracurriculars, don't pull that from them as well. A lot of times what happens is they want to withdraw from everything and all of a sudden you're pulling them from school and we're going to go to a different school now and we're pulling you from your baseball team or whatever sports team we're pulling you from piano. If you keep things as normal as possible and keeping things that your child likes and enjoys, uh, that was one of the big things I, I had a student, this past summer that was dealing with this and it was fresh for him, but mom and dad kept, he loved fishing. So mom and dad would both bring him fishing all the time and he loved riding his bike. And so it was taking him on bike rides and it made things, obviously things were hard for him and going into a school year of what is it going to look like? Who's picking me up? But he still had, the things he loved and he was still able to do those things. And so things were kind of normal still. So everything wasn't totally turned upside down. And that's where things get real stressful and hard on students is when everything gets flipped. And now all of a sudden they're buried under a new home, a new school, new friends, uh, no activities. They, they, they feel like they're a loner now all of a sudden, where if you keep things, for the most part, consistent, they can get through it a little better. And things kind of, they have outlets now of, okay, I can at least go to practice and have my friends there. I can play my instrument and that, that takes away some of the stress. So keeping as much as you can kind of I guess, normal for them, even though it's obviously going to be hard throughout the day, they have those outlets at least. I think that's excellent. Yeah, because this is not a normal time. Uh, and so if they can hold on to those normalcies that they value, it can be truly helpful. So I know that you have a master's in divinity. And so you certainly include the spiritual aspect in dealing with uh, teens and youth. So can you give us a few um, spiritual encouragements or tips as we deal with our, uh, our teenagers and our youth? Yeah, I mean, obviously the biggest thing, and it's more or less, I guess, a canned answer for the most part is prayer. Uh, mm -hmm. that's, that's obviously the biggest thing is praying for your child and, we should be doing that no matter what. Um, but yeah, especially when things are hard that way is being in prayer for them when, when things are hard and at things at times seem overwhelming for them. Prayer is one of the biggest things. Mm -hmm. um, and then obviously church is another big thing. Uh, that, that's a place where it's a safe place for your child and being plugged in at some point. 
Um, as a youth leader, we had several, several families that went through divorce and being able to come alongside of the kid. And now it's somebody who's not the parent who is able to come alongside of them and, Hey, I'm, I'm here for you. Um, and churches are, are supposed to be that, that extra family, um, and that listening ear and being able to take your kid out to lunch or coffee or whatever it is. And now it's, you don't get that stigma of it's not a counselor. So they'll open up a little more Mm -hmm. and this is my friend and they want, they care about me and they want to hear my story and what's what I'm going through. Because a lot of times if you're getting your kid into counseling, that's, they don't want to open up because it's a counselor and this person is just going to tell me all of everything that's going on with me is wrong. Where if it's in a church setting and it's a pastor, it's a youth leader. Now it's a, it's a person that cares about me. This isn't a counselor. It's, it's my youth leader and they, they want to hear my story. Um, So I think those are a couple like really important things um, spiritually wise is just having that church church body there to to kind of help you through it i i really love that jim uh and makes me appreciate so much the work that you do in being that friend who goes out with coffee and i totally get it why youth may repel against a counselor and yet be open to talk to someone at church who is a friend who can be a friend Um, So very valuable. Thank you for your work that you do and your contribution into the lives of these kids who are, they're confused, uh, bewildered. And so if they can have someone stable like you, who's going to say, you know what, I'm going to listen and it's going to be okay. It's so incredibly valuable. So thank you for your work. Thank you for this, uh, taking time out of your busy day, sitting in your car <laughs> as, you, as you travel around and do what, uh, what you need to do. But thank you for taking time for us today, Jim. Yeah, thank you. And I'm glad it's not snowing. So that's, that's the plus. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this is a true plus. All right. Thank you so much and have a great day. And thanks everyone thank you. for being here. You bet.